I'm very impressed to see so many people here after a night of table dancing, so congratulations for making it. Um, but I'm sure, like me, you're absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to hear from Jenny Waldman, director of the extraordinary 1418 Now programme, and the great artist Jeremy Della. The theme of our talk is to think about the ways in which arts and artists have reimagined and re-enlivened um, the whole idea of national moments. And that's something that um, Jenny and the whole 1418 Now programme have addressed in quite extraordinary ways. It's also something that Jeremy has a great history in. Uh, we were talking about one of the earliest national moments that he engaged with being, of course, the Battle of Orgreave, not necessarily a moment that the government of the time wanted us to remember and celebrate, but an important one nonetheless. So in that wider context of work, um, we're going to be talking about a number of things this morning, but the particular focus is an extraordinary piece of work that Jenny and Jeremy were involved in making last year. Of course, we are here. One of the great artistic moments of the last few years and a true reinvention of how we think about something like the First World War and the Battle of the Somme. So we're going to start off with Jeremy um, talking to us a little bit about that particular piece of work. Thank you, John. Now, yes. Great. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly because we don't have that much time, but really I was asked by Jenny to think about the Somme um, a few years before it actually happened. She said they were sort of struggling a little bit to think about how you commemorate a disaster. And I, I quite quickly thought, well, if you're going to make a memorial, a war memorial, it should actually not be an object. It should be people because it was people that were killed, obviously, on that day, 19,000. And so it should be a memorial that actually intervenes in the public life of the country and is up for one day because it's commemorating a day and it shouldn't be something that the public go to it's something that the, the public it goes to the public effectively so the idea which i had on my bicycle i remember having the idea very clearly on my bicycle um, on the liverpool road uh, was just to have men and it was men in the end that we we used uh, to appear around Britain on the day in groups uh, in the morning and then just travel through the United Kingdom. And we had about 1,500 in the end. They would be in First World War uniform, they wouldn't speak, and they would just go through modern Britain, basically, contemporary Britain. I wanted to avoid heritage places, churches, museums, castles, all those sort of heritage Britain sites, and just go to contemporary Britain places that would not have existed in 1916. And if you'd have come back from, you know, if you'd, if you'd, if you'd have been from 1916, you would not recognise Britain, as we would not recognise it from 100 years ago. Uh, so it was about being and almost infecting those spaces. This is Manchester. We started the day with groups of men in transport hubs, which meant you got a lot of visibility very quickly, because I realised that the digital aspect of this would be huge if it started in a way in the mornings and people would start taking photographs and would tweet about it, um, what's going on, what's happening here, and then it would just proliferate, basically. Another very important part was that we weren't telling anyone it was happening. I think it was very important that it was kept a secret, which in a way goes against a lot of these big events because they're, they're, you know, they cost so much to do, and everything now seems to be uh, hyped or... or, or or, or talked of before it happens, and this is very important, but it didn't. So the, the reaction of the public was raw, and it was primary. It wasn't something they were attuned to or expecting. Um, the soldiers gave out cards with the name of a dead soldier on, and, this is the, and they would do that to anyone that paid any interest in them, and this is one, one example of that. Um, I won't talk for much longer, but I will say that I think the reaction of the public was something we were not expecting, because we were training the men to expect trouble from the public because we just weren't sure how they would react to seeing soldiers on the streets. And we did this in Northern Ireland as well. This happened throughout the whole of the UK. And we had all these scenarios of drunk people, people offended by the military and so on. And in the end, what we didn't, were not training the, the men for was that people were crying in front of them and being very upset and very, being very moved by them. We weren't expecting that response. And I suspect that was because what, when this happened, it was the day after um, the, the week after the EU referendum result, and I think the public were 
absolutely sort of disgusted by sort of public life in Britain, what had happened in those previous weeks and what was still happening in the country at the time. And this sort of brought something home to them that was actually real in a sense about the real nature of sacrifice. So that was something we couldn't have known four years ago when we commissioned this. And it was just by chance that it happened at this very sort of fractious moment in British public life. Thank you, Joe. That's my little three minutes chat about it. I mean, I think one of the things that was extraordinary about that work was that it didn't tell anybody what to think. It didn't tell you what your response should be. And therefore, you know, following it, both in, in real life and on social media, people made their, made their own journeys and responses in relation to the work. And it had a resonance for pacifists. It had a resonance for... First World War enthusiasts, but each went on a, a journey in terms of what they thought about it and how, how they responded. And I think, Jenny, that has been the extraordinary achievement of the whole 1418 Now programme, is that it, has, it hasn't corralled our response, it hasn't told us how we must behave or what we must do in relation to these uh, moments of memorial but it's opened up what our responses could be. Would you talk us through a little bit of the wider context of 1418 now and um, some of the other work? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I'll, I'll, um, I'll touch on that. Just to explain for those of you that don't know, 1418 now is... Oh, you didn't show that one. Yeah. Uh, 1418 now is a five-year programme of arts commissions for the centenary... Uh, we commission artists from all art forms. We work in partnership with arts and heritage organisations right across the UK and internationally. We're hosted within the Imperial War Museum, which gives us access to their brilliant archive collections and historians. So we can invite artists to delve into those archives and talk to historians. And then, of course, we let them fly. And one of the things I think is interesting about these anniversaries is that they say as much about the world we live in today as they say about the First World War or whatever it is they're commemorating. So artists now, of course, uh, use contemporary practice. Uh, they talk to an audience today. And <clears throat> one of the things that is striking um, amongst a number of our commissions, I'd say the majority of them, is that they involve people in either the development or in the presentation of them. So when you're talking about uh, not telling people what to think, absolutely, artists open things up. They don't close them down. They don't sort of say, and artists now tend not to want to make a statue on a pedestal that suggests that you need to kind of look up and be respectful. I heard the historian Jay Winter talk recently about how memorialization has gone from the vertical to the horizontal, and I think that's very interesting. There is something quite democratic about um, the uh, commissions programme that we've done and the centenary generally, I think, at the moment. Letter to an Unknown Soldier is an example of that where um, the writers Neil Bartlett and Kate Pullinger invited all of us to write our own letter to the Unknown Soldier statue on Paddington Station, on Platform 1 of Paddington Station, who is, as you'll remember, reading a letter. And they wanted us all to write that letter and over 21,000 people wrote a letter and it was yes the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and Stephen Fry and uh, Dawn French but also an 83 year old in Hull and lots of school children and when the book was published a whole range of those letters that's the artwork uh, those 21,000 letters are now in the British Library and that is a kind of snapshot I suppose of people's thoughts about it when we started um, we did a project called Lights Out uh, on the 4th of August 2014. Uh, we invited everyone to turn their lights out uh, for an hour. Uh, it was uh, inspired by Lord Grey's phrase about the lights going out just before uh, the, the, the dawn of the... or the, just before Great Britain went to war in 1914. And we invited artists to create uh, artworks in each of the four capitals of the nation. Indeed, Jeremy did one digital. This is, this is the Rio Giacada piece in London, and this is Bodden Roberta Smith in Belfast, which was created by the communities in Belfast. Um, another piece that involved people 
uh, in vast numbers was the, the giants, the Royal Deluxe Giants uh, in Liverpool. A lot of the work is in the public realm. It's what artists choose to do. They want to connect with people. And of course, it means that we get a much broader range of people. One of the things that we did after Jeremy's project, this is a beautiful Yinka Shonabari piece at Turner Contemporary, um, and I'll talk about the Dazzle Ships in a moment, but one of the things that we did um, after Jeremy's project is we did some polling. We found out that 63% of the population were aware of Jeremy's project by the end of the day. So having no awareness at all at the beginning of the day, we got to 30 million people by the end of the day, which was pretty extraordinary. And you can ask our head of communication, Claire, Eva, afterwards how that was done, because it was pretty extraordinary. It was all entirely in Jeremy's conception. But the stat that I was probably most proud of that was that of those people, of that 30 million, 43% said it made them want to find out more about the First World War. So I think that what we're doing in inviting artists to uh, open things up is that we're, we're getting people intrigued, and I hope that is leading people to museums. This Dazzle Ferry, which I'm sure many of you have been on, it goes across from Liverpool to Birkenhead, but also the Manchester Ship Canal, has a little exhibition on it that explores dazzle design in the First World War, the history of the Mersey ferries requisitioned as troop carriers in the First World War, and of course, stuff on Peter Blake and that particular uh, dazzle design. I think I'll stop there. Thanks, Jenny. So, so Jeremy, Jenny just talked about some of the, the impacts of the work, you know, 30 million people knowing about it, people wanting to know more about the First World War. I imagine, as an artist, that was not your starting point, you know, wanting people to know more about the First World War. So can you talk a little bit about what the brief was to you and how that brief felt and how you took it and ran with it? The brief was basically, <coughs> what are we going to do about, what are we going to do about the song, Jeremy? Absolutely. <laughs> what can, uh, it's true. We're, we're, strugg we're struggling, if I can say that, Absolutely we're struggling right. a bit to how you commemorate a disaster, basically yeah. the worst day in military history for this country. What do you do with that, and how do you do it in an interesting way that has not... Well, I think you wanted me to do something that hadn't been done before, I, I presume. I mean, that's what you want to do as an artist. Mm. And so I wrote uh, an email. I had this idea, and I wrote an email. And I think that's the only time I wrote something... I, had, I wrote something was written down. I didn't have to fill in any forms or anything, that's for sure. And uh, it was just a sort of a very trusting relationship, because I think the idea was simple enough to describe in a sentence or two sentences. It's actually quite a complicated thing to yeah. do, as you can imagine. But it was just, um, the brief was the Somme, question mark, what do we do about it? So you weren't being asked to fulfil any particular goals or targets no. or anything at all? <clears throat> no. It was a very open offer. As soon as you do that with an artist, well, yeah. me, or my, a lot of artists, you just like close down, you just, you just, just don't want to know. But I get, you know, you do get asked to make an artwork that that is about social cohesion and uh, disparity <laughs> in the, the British society, and the, you know this, that, and the other in a print. It's like, how do you do that in a print? I mean, you, that's a book. It's not really a, an artwork. Uh, so, no, I think the more if you're given all of those guidelines, or or, or you're given the, the pressure is put upon you to do that, then I think that's actually not a very good thing to do. I think it's the best thing is to be open. And then these things follow, don't they? If, if the work is good enough, I think. And it sounds like this brief was both open but quite specific as well. Well, it was specific because it was about a day. Yeah. Something had to happen on a day, yeah. and it had to be about this one thing. But actually, it could be anything. Yeah. And and so it was actually very. It was very open. And 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 uh, for me, I was very interested in that. And Jenny, was there any particular lesson from from this from this commission? Oh, yes. I think be brave. Mm -hmm. I think be brave and let the artist take the lead. I think um, I think I learned that the, the most successful projects are when it starts with you thinking, have absolutely no idea how this can be done. So it was a really clear idea in Jeremy's head. He'd conceived pretty well the whole thing in one go. We didn't know how then to put thousands of men in accurate First World War costume onto the streets on one day and walk them around in groups. 
And so we thought, first of all, is this a film company? Is this extras? Do we go to a film company? Then we started talking to the National Theatre and to Rufus Norris, the director of the National Theatre, and formed an amazing partnership with Birmingham Rep, the National Theatre, National Theatre Wales, where you were at the time, John, National Theatre of Scotland, and in the end, 26 theatres. And none of them had done it before either. So it was, fine, it was finding a way, the, the comms piece of keeping it secret, which was very clearly what Jeremy wanted, and then uh, getting it out there quickly. So all of those things, yeah, just just go go with it, be brave, let the artist fly, um, and partnerships. I think partnerships work where there's generosity on all sides, and uh, everyone involved got such a lot out of it. I was very, ex <clears throat> I was very excited to work with the National Theatre mm -hmm. as an artist. It was always good to go outside a world that I knew about. I know about the art world and the museum world. I really know nothing about theatre. For me, it was kind of a thrill to work with, with theatres around Britain. And that's something, I guess, that Jenny and her team were sort of brokering for you and Absolutely. making it possible. Yeah, we had a meeting. You said something really interesting about the difference between visual arts and theatre. Well, visual artists are usually sort of miserable people, on, as a rule. <laughs> And theatre people are very enthusiastic and like doing things and running around in a they room. They kept and saying talking. to you, they kept saying to you, yes, we can do this. Yes. How about that? How like, about I'm not used to that, <laughs> this sort of level of positivity around things. But uh, I was very happy to have that energy. And, you know, oh, yeah, we can get 50 people and dress them up and do this. And it's like, wow, that's amazing. So I was very happy to <laughs> exploit people's happiness and positivity <laughs> in that world. Also, the, miserable ends. More or less, yes, you know, to commemorate a mass slaughter of uh, human beings. So I think that was good. Also, the idea of a secret was important because the, the battle was meant to be a secret. You know, battles are meant to be secrets. And actually, uh, someone was overheard on a telephone on an insecure line the night before, wishing someone luck the next day with the battle. And that was one reason why the slaughter was so extreme, because the Germans knew it was going to happen. So. It, well, that wasn't going to happen with us if the secret got out, obviously, but it, that's why secrets are good to have in some ways, in art and in war, weirdly. And brilliant that you went against you know, all of the norms of how you market or communicate a project and just used the piece itself to create its own publicity. Um, we're going to do a couple of questions from the audience. It's a pretty tight slot, um, but after Hillary did the enthusiastic arm waving, uh, we're going to go to questions in a moment for whoever waves most enthusiastically. Um, but before that, I've got one more question each for well, the same question this time to both of you. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot about work that responds to the 1418, now to the First World War period. Is there another example that you would give of great work where an artist has responded to a, a national or international event um, and made something of it that creates an equivalent intervention, Jenny? I've got one. I okay, you start. You. Okay. you start. That's actually a very recent one that's about 500 yards from here, which you were involved in, John, but I think is an amazing one. It's Phil Collins, the artist, brought a statue of Friedrich Engels from the Ukraine, in a way, back to Manchester. So it took a discredited figure, probably in, in the Eastern Bloc, of, of this discredited ideology, and brought it back to Manchester, where he lived and where he wrote the Communist Manifesto and also for conditions of the working class in England, and is now a, a permanent statue in Manchester which I think puts him back in his, his rightful place as a great social historian, an economic historian. So for me, that's like a... I was very jealous when I heard about this, because I thought, that, I wish I'd <laughs> thought of that one. But Phil, but Phil has a great knack of doing artworks, which I thought, which I wish I thought I'd done, basically. <laughs> I hope he has the same feeling about me, but uh, I, uh, I loved... I think that was an amazing work. Great. If anybody wants to visit that one, if you nip over... Um, just around the corner to Home Arts Centre, Friedrich Engels now stands proudly, rather gloriously, in Tony Wilson Place. Uh, I think it's a, a memorial that Tony Wilson would have liked. I love and it. apparently some people, I mean, you'll wonder, what, you'll wonder how when you look at it, but some people go there genuinely believing it's a statue of Tony Wilson. So, 
That's fantastic. <laughs> Jenny, did, you, did, you, better. did you have one or do you want I've to go to the I've got a memorial audience? of a different sort, which is, uh, which is a much quieter memorial and not of a national moment, but it's Rachel White Reed's house, mm. which I saw, um, in fact, I took my kids to when they were quite little in the 90s when it was there, and it's, as you will know, a cast of a house that was being uh, demolished in the East End in Bow in London. And uh, it was, what was so extraordinary about it was that it, it spoke to the history of that house in an incredibly intimate way. You saw how small the interior of the house was. You saw all the kind of detail of the, the windows and how all the kind of the Victorian architecture had worked. And you thought about what's being lost with redevelopment in an incredibly beautiful way. And the fact that the local authority refused it mm. further planning permission to stay is all part of its story. But I think it had a, a very profound effect on both Rachel Whiteread's work and also a, a, a lot of other work of the time and since. And it certainly stayed with me as something where you can reveal something about heritage in one kind of bold move. Yeah. and everyone around can see it. And again, the audience was everyone who lived there as well as anyone who visited. And a reminder that the domestic can also yeah, be of Absolutely important, yeah. Great, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. So is anybody waving enthusiastically? <laughs> Somebody over there, hello. Um, a few days ago in The Guardian, the columnist Simon Jenkins argued that we should stop commemorating um, uh, wars, particularly, in fact, the First World War. His argument being that the message, lest we forget, has lost all meaning, um, and that is precisely commemorating and too much remembering that is behind most of the conflicts in the world today. So his conclusion was that we should do more forgetting. How would the panel respond? I would. I I, I, you know, it's an interesting thought, um, I can understand it, but I think most people were interested in the Somme, from what I know, about from their personal family histories. That's what, you know, you talk to people about the First World War a lot of the time, and they talk about great uncles, grandfathers, great grandfathers, people they never met, but they were heard about through their parents and their grandparents. And I think a lot of people still have a personal connection to the First World War, which was surprising to me personally. And I think people interpreted my work particularly in that way. And strangely, in Manchester, you know, every soldier, every participant had a card they gave out. And in Manchester, within half an hour, someone had given a card representing the soldier to a relative of the person that he was representing. So, and I think that is where it worked in the very personal nature of the work. Um, I would, I would in part agree with Simon Jenkins if he is talking about a kind of ritualistic ceremonial, because I do still have a bit of a problem with that. I think what we're trying to do is something different, and I think that by involving artists from. Uh, all the countries that, um, that participated in the First World War, looking at the narratives that are less well known. The one on the screen here is the uh, Dr. Blighty project in Brighton Pavilion, which told the story and video mapping of the uh, Hindu, Sikh and Muslim soldiers involved in the First World War. So I think there are ways of looking at war which are looking at it in more in the round and less to do with um, a kind of nationalistic poppy wearing and, um, and ceremonial that has in some places a tendency, in some ways a tendency to go to something that might encourage um, a, a feeling of what might be called Little Britain. But I think that, I think that the way that the the centenary is being handled now is very different from that. I think he's got quite an old-fashioned view about, um, about the centenary, and it's not reflected in what's happening everywhere now. Another enthusiastic waiver. I'm sure there is one. Come on. People can do table dancing must be able to ask a question. 
Yes, at the back there. Hello. I'm from Barnsley Museums, where I know you filmed some of the Battle of Orgreave. And um, I just wondered whether, because it's such an emotional topic still, mm. whether you ever think about returning to subject matters that you've created artworks on um, in years following, I guess. You mean the miners' strike? Yes. I don't think I would return to it. I felt I did as much as I could at the time. And in a way, I felt that, you know, with artists, you, you often, you're getting to something maybe a little bit before other people, in a way. You're doing something that should not be done. That's a bit wrong, basically, by recreating a battle from the miners' strike as a public event, as a piece of performance art. There's something quite wrong about that and, and slightly awkward and absurd. And I felt that I was bringing up a subject that hadn't been discussed and maybe by doing that at that time it was helping that process of people looking at that event again and strike again maybe it was during the, the height of new labor and the, that uh, moment when that party probably were, uh, really didn't want to discuss the strike it was just like ancient history and that's why I wanted to do it but I feel that now the strike is back not just because of me no, at all it is totally back in the sort of public realm in terms of the discussions and so on so so to answer your question, no, I don't think I would return. I, I, actually, I would. I would like to make a feature film about the strike, but I wouldn't make an artwork necessarily. I'd, I'd like to make a feature film about it. So yes and no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All the best answers are yeah. double-edged. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. I love this formal approach to the microphone. There's great anticipation. <laughs> uh, would you say that 1418 now has marked actually a change in memorial culture? You mentioned Jay Winter and the move from the vertical to the horizontal. There is a sense that memorial culture, when it was vertical, was meant to seal a past moment. Whereas I have the impression that 1418 does a lot more in terms of opening up discussion about the current relevance of a past moment rather than closing something. Uh, yes, I think that's what we're hoping to do, um, and I think that's why um, that's what artists can bring to it. Because contemporary artists will always be talking about the world today. So if you invite an artist to delve into the past, they will be doing both. They'll be doing they'll be looking at the past in order to talk to the world about the world today and look to the future. So I think it is all about opening up. Um, and that it will be an interesting moment in a year's time about what happens at the end of the centenary and whether the general public feel that there is closure of some sort, that actually, you know, would we, would we be doing the same in 50 years' time? Would there be another, would there be a 150th anniversary of the First World War in quite such a way that... Uh, that the, the government and uh, national museums and 1418 now have all been doing uh, quite such a lot. It's been in everybody's program, in theatres, in, uh, in cinemas and so on. I don't know. If you looked at the um, Battle of Waterloo 200th, it didn't have the same, but maybe the First World War... I, I've begun to feel that the First World War has a sort of... Um, it's a sort of metaphor for, for war for us now. It, because of the art of the time, because of the extraordinary paintings and poetry, there is something that has seeped into us. And I, I think that it's like the civil war in the States. It has, it's the essence of war. And it's the essence of war on a very, very personal basis. It's about, it's about the mud and the blood and the personal tragedy. And I hope what we've opened up is a lot more than that. But I think there is something that the, those essential qualities will always make people intrigued about the First World War. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, Hilary McGowan, consultant, but speaking as a trustee of Bletchley Park. Um, I wonder if what the panel feel we can learn as maybe in three or four years' time we start to plan the centenary of the Second World War. That is the sort of thing that we have already started talking about on the board of Bletchley Park. Um, I wonder what the lessons are and whether we should go about it in the same or a different way. Good question. 
Well, um, I'll say two, two things. First of all, it won't be me. <laughs> uh, so it'll be a different organisation. But I really, really hope that artists are invited to play a central part in it. Um, and that uh, if there are lessons to be learnt from 1418 now, uh, invite artists to, uh, to investigate, explore, reflect. Don't overbrief them. Don't write the brief in pages and pages before. Just invite them to Bletchley Park and other places which are so incredibly rich in inspiration and see what happens and you'll get something fantastic. Brilliant. And Jeremy, just to finish off, have yes. you got a uh, thought or advice or um, uh, a steer for museums and the sector in general in terms of working with artists and just, yeah, collaborating in a artistic frame i think just let i mean give them as give them give the artist as much freedom as you can try and trust their judgment on things i mean it depends on the artist obviously i wouldn't some artists i'd never trust but, I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, but try and work with the correct artists that you can trust <laughs> and don't give them too many things like oh this has to be about this you have to get these kind of people in these people where well, we want these people because we don't you know just let them make something and then you see what happens. So I think just be open and don't try and box people in too much with requirements and forms, especially. And, uh, that, that would be my ideal way. And do things outside. Yes. Do things for free. Yeah. Then you get loads of people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when we took the poppies to the Woodhall Museum, you've probably heard this um, from Kevin, but uh, it was a big free event and uh, it was there for about six weeks, I think, Weeping Window in the Woodhall Museum, beautiful, beautiful, on the head of the colliery, and his attendance figures went up by 1,400%. So no forms, do it outside, <laughs> and keep it secret. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A counterintuitive start to the morning. Yeah. It has been a total pleasure to share the stage with Jenny and with Jeremy. Um, both of whom have created such extraordinary bodies of work and I think who collaborated last year on really one of the most significant um, works of public art that's been made um, in, in memory, actually, in the UK. So thank you so much for sharing insight into, into that um, particular project and into all the work that you do. Thanks Ooh. to all of you for... And there's a book. Oh, and there's a, there's a book. Jenny Flying will be signing books at the back of the auditorium. <laughs> no, it's Jeremy's book on the piece. <laughs> well, there's a, really a very beautiful book. If you, if you enjoyed some of those images, a lot of them are still online on the 1418 Now website, um, but this book's a, a, a really wonderful treatment of that day and of all the work that went into it. Thanks so much for getting up early um, to be here you with now. us. You can go to bed now. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can't actually because I know having, no, you can't, having just... Um, <laughs> yes, Jeremy. <laughs> having just been in Buenos Aires uh, and been at the Memorial Museum there, um, it, you're about to be treated to an extraordinary talk. Um, again, about one of the most um, significant interventions in public memory um, through museums and through the work of artists. So i um, hand you over now uh, to um, what I think is going to be a keynote well worth listening to. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>